Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's innovation webinar. My name is Fernando and I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association and I'll be your webinar host today. So feel free to contact me via the chat option of Zoom with any logistical questions you may have regarding audio, video, or any connection issues. This webinar session will be recorded and made available for on-demand consumption after today. You may find this recording up on our website at wwwregion the number nine hsa.org. We encourage your participation, so feel free to send us your questions via the Q&A option of Zoom, or simply click the button that says raise your hand, which will allow your microphone to be unmuted to speak directly to the entire room. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our topic for today, Pushing Data, presented by Michael Mitchell from North Las Vegas Accelerator Learning. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join this webinar. Um, and just want to say thank you to the Region 9 Head Start Association for allowing us this, this time to talk about our data. Um, there's two of us on the call, so we just want to go ahead and introduce ourselves. My name is Michael Tomas Mitchell. I'm the Executive Director of Oslo Learning, Clark County, and I've been with Oslo Learning since 2000. And I'm Amber Early, the Director of Monitoring, Compliance, and Analysis, and I have been in this role with Oslo Learning since 2013. So we're, we're both excited about this topic. Amber, I think, because she's our Director of Monitoring, Compliance, and, and Analysis and, and spends a lot of her time in the data field. And myself, you know, my, my background in education is in social sciences, so big lover of, of social statistics and, and other data. Um, and so we're, we're really excited for today. And so we just wanted to first start by talking about some of the things that Amber and I are, are proud of um, over this program year. So for me, I'm really excited that this year is the first year of Oslo Learning Clark County um, has provided early head start. So we were part of early head start expansion whereby we received 84 slots for children in four sites across 11 classrooms. And uh, we rolled out MBE and MBO reports, which we're excited to actually share with you this afternoon, which is new to our program this year as well. So I wanna take a, a quick pause here and just invite anyone else to share one of the things they've accomplished this year that, that they feel particularly excited or, or proud about. Anyone willing to share out with us? At this time, you can use the uh, raise your hand button so I can unmute your microphone or feel free to use the Q&A option as well to type in your responses. Um, if you need any assistance, for fee feel free to message me directly and, and I can assist you with that. Great, so I, I see here um, one of our participants, Monica, developed a five-year strategic plan using a collaborative planning process. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. And, and I know that we all had some, some great successes this year, and we always like to start from a, from a strength-based perspective. But also I think it's, it's important to think about in our, in our accomplishments, there's so many pieces of data we use that allowed us to be successful or in some cases, there's data that we can use to allow us to be even more successful. Um, and, and really that's, that's the point of data. And so today in this session, what we'll talk about um, is strategies for supporting your staff's ability to use effective data. Our first learning objective is to identify key components of useful data, as well as understand program prerequisites for promoting growth using data. The reason we start with this is while data is so critically important, it's really how our staff um, are able to utilize and the level at which they feel comfortable utilizing data that has the greatest impact. So even before we look at what data we use, it's important to think about what are those components. So in thinking about useful data, the first thing I think about is that the data needs to be reliable and it needs to be transparent. Obviously, if we're making data to make decisions, 
We can only make good decisions as far as the data is reliable to us. Similarly, it should be transparent. So we'll talk a lot today about how we put data into the hands of all of our staff, but there should be really no secrets behind what Second, um, particularly for us here at Head Start, should be collected across multiple service areas. The more people are able to transparently see the data and share it with each other, uh, the more likely they are to use it in effective ways and use it to drive positive change for your program. Finally, data should be diverse in nature. It should represent different points of time throughout the, the year or different points of time throughout the program. It should represent various areas of contact content and it should give multiple opportunities for analysis. Um, sometimes we think data is, is only outcomes data when really the, the best, most useful data is data that we can use in, in a variety of settings at a variety of different to continually make decisions. For our so now that we know the components, let's talk a little bit about the pre prerequisites for program growth. So first, your program environment should acknowledge the successes and work that have been achieved. Um, oftentimes when we look at data, it's easy to go right to what we want to improve. But we first need to acknowledge for our staff what has been done and what was successful. Then we need to promote an openness to learning from reflection. Um, sometimes you'll see data um, used as, as just a final evaluation instead of something to help us think about our practices. We really want to promote reflection across all levels within our programs. With that in mind, it should provide two-way feedback opportunities. Data isn't a time for us to tell parents how they're performing or tell our staff how they're performing. It's a chance to really have an, an ongoing conversation about what's going well and opportunities for our growth. And finally, as a program, you really need to emphasize a focus on the use of data as an asset. Um, it should be something that people feel comfortable looking at, should feel comfortable being in the space that they're reflecting on, engaging in conversation on. And if you think about a staff member that when data comes to their hands, they know it's going to be used to celebrate their success. They know that they can reflect and learn from it. They know that they can in, engage in, in two-way feedback conversations and they see it as a value add. That staff member is also is obviously going to use data in a meaningful and successful now, the opposite of that is we have to disarm data. Staff can often see data as a weapon used against them. Um, really, what should happen is data should draw our attention, but not the final. Really, what we mean that, by that is it's a piece of discovery, not an end-all, be-all. In addition to that, data should not be used to blind us. And think about that. what that means. I want to do a quick activity with a short video. Um, so this is a, a simple awareness test. Um, it might be a little hard to hear on the volume, but basically as you this watch this, there's test. going to be two teams. Passes. Does the team Just count the number of passes the team in white makes. Only the team in white. Is so let me ask, how many of you got the got the correct answer of 13? Let's do a show of hands if you if you got the correct answer of 13. Now my second question, did anyone notice anything else? Feel free to chat in or buzz in if you notice something else. It looks like Brenda has her hand up, so I will go ahead and unmute your microphone, Brenda, if you have anything to, to say to the, to the group.
You there, Brenda? All right, so let's go ahead and watch the video and see what else you notice. But did you see the moonwalking bear? I really love this example because often when we're looking at data, we know what we're looking for instead of having a really open mind to the reality of what's occurring. And so the first time I watched that video, I was pumped. I saw 13 passes, but I did not see the bear. So much so that I restarted the video because I thought this must be two different videos. There's no way I missed that and discover I totally missed that. And so that's one of the risks of data if, if we already know what we're looking for, or if we're just trying to prove our own point, it can blind us to, to what we could actually see. Whereas what data should do is drive us, show us where greater attention is needed, allow us then to pull back the layers to see the bigger picture, and show our strengths and areas of accomplishment. Um, so in doing that, I would say we should all take the time to check our culture as we dive into the various types of data we at Ocelero use, and ask ourselves the following question. One, will this data empower our staff as decision makers? Um, the, the strongest programs across all levels, their staff are able to look at data and know that they're allowed to make decisions on proactive next steps based on the data that they're collecting. So we should be empowering our staff. Then we should use the data to cultivate a culture where we're comfortable identifying missed opportunities and even failures. When you set goals, priorities, benchmarks, data will often tell you that you're hitting that mark and it's a great chance to celebrate. Other times it will tell you that you're off track and you need to course correct. At that time, it can, easy, it can be easy to be upset or discouraged um, or even go into reactive problem solving, but the data needs to be our friend in that point and that we don't get upset at what we see, but see the opportunity for, for course correct. And then finally, we should ask ourselves, are we using data primarily to learn and grow or to determine the quality of our staff? There's certainly a place for evaluation with data, but the primary driver should always be how we're learning and growing as we do that. So now that we've thought about the culture, I'm gonna turn it over to Amber to talk about some of the specific tools. So on the next slides that we're gonna review are some examples that we at Ocelero use and to share data with all levels of staff, managers, board, PC, and even parents. We're gonna look at the frequency in which we review the data and how the presentations may change with the different clients. I also wanna reiterate or mention that the particular data we're sharing with you is completely fabricated and made up for the purpose of this training. And we're also gonna ask for you to review the data with us to share what you may see when looking at the reports. The first example of a report that we use here within Ocelero is what we call the daily director report. It is a breakdown of all service area indicators and it is sent to management level staff on a daily basis. So as you can see, we look at enrollment, all indicators around enrollment compliance, education compliance, and health compliance. So just looking at this report, we want to ask you if there's anything that you see that you may want to dig deeper at or just looking at these numbers you may inquire or talk to staff about. So when you find something that stands out to you, go ahead and send in the chat or raise your hand. So for me, something that stands out is the disparity in attendance numbers between a center such as Center 2 
and a center such as center nine. So that's a really good opportunity to talk to center two about what are their attendance plans, what are they doing to, to show success, as well as pull back the layers on the situation at center nine to determine what may be causing lower intensity. Michael and Amber, there's some uh, responses in the chat. Yep, so I see it said, one of the questions here is how we use EPSDT on a daily basis. So really by, by ongoing monitoring, it will give all of our staff a daily checkpoint to see like, is, you know, are they at risk of anything being past due? Are they following up? Are they providing the, the requisite support needed? I think that leads into another re-report that we generate daily, and that is our education screenings report. So this particular report is a list of all children who have recently entered who have not yet had a screening. So it compares the child's due date to their entry date, and it is also something that our management gets every day to help work with their staff on to make sure we are in compliance. The report breaks down um, the screenings that are required for our Head Start children, our early Head Start children, and then we even look at the rescreens that are due. So again, information that's sent to staff daily to be able to make sure that we are in compliance. Yep. And so every day, our center directors, our early learning inclusion specialists, or the managers of our center directors and our director of education will see this report. On the far left where it's cut out would be the child's name. And so there's a very easy ongoing record of when a screening comes due, which means if we're a week away from a screening coming due, it's really easy for a center director to give staff a reminder. Um, similarly, it's really easy for an Ellis to reach out to a center director and make sure that there's a plan in place to complete those screenings. You know, maybe it's two or three days from coming due, and that might be the point where our director of education will reach out to, to ensure there's a plan in place make sure staff are, are mobilized in such a way that those screenings are, are able to be done in an efficient manner. And while this is really about education screenings, it's very easy to replicate the same type of report with health screenings um, for things like, um, you know, dentals, physicals, and whatnot. So any questions here? And we're going to go ahead and go on, but feel free to ask questions as we, as we go along. So this is an example of what we call our service area MBI, MBI meaning management by information. This particular report is sent to all staff. We have MBIs for all service areas. So this one here on your screen is our family services report. We replicate the report for Ursia Health and education and mental health. So it pertains their compliant information. All of those service area reports go to all levels of staff within Ocelero. Um, and it's sent by me every Monday. It also shows detailed information. So the information that's underlined is actually hyperlinked to the system so that any staff member can click the number and it'll take them to the system to be able to see which families are enrolled which families have blank entries, and every indicator. Um, and it also shows historical data for trending so that you can see week over week how the program is trending. So just take a minute to look. This is a lot of data, so take a minute to look at it and let us know what stands out to you. And while you're thinking about what stands out to you, you might also ask, you know, what, what data are you tracking now that's beneficial to you, as well as what data do you feel like you're not tracking now that if you tracked, you could have stronger outcomes?
Yeah, so we got the question of what data management system we use. Um, we use a system called Shine Insight. And so we pull this report. And as Amber said, we hyperlink it to that Shine Insight system. And so if, I, if, if you see the column, you know, children with blank entry date, I would click on that, that number one and it will pull up that child's record for me, um, which is obviously very useful when we're looking at things like health screenings. The other thing I think you know is worth explaining is our peer cards are at home activities, learning activities that are linked to our curriculum that we have families engage in on a, on a daily basis. And same thing, I can click on that number and know exactly the families that are engaged versus those that might not be engaged. So the weekly report that we just looked at is broken down by center, um, but this is another report that also gets sent out weekly and it is now a drill down of that previous report, but on an individual staff level. So this particular example is a center that has 81 enrolled children with three advocates. So it'll break it down now instead of the center level, the advocate level. Again, as Michael was saying, the numbers are hyperlinked. So advocate number one has 24 children on their caseload. Um, and then from there, all the hyperlinks are a breakdown of those 24 children. So an example of this, if, if I was the manager or the staff, because either can run this report, they can look at time management for the week, and then again, they can work on their individual need. Um, an example of this would be a peer card. So 24 children for advocate one are enrolled. And then down below, we can easily see that 14 of those children have not completed a home activity card. And this is a card we use to track family engagement. So whether the advocate or the manager wanted to easily see who those 14 children were, they would just click that number. And again, it helps them drive their time management and their workload through the day. It also allows them to work with those 14 families on what we could possibly do to provide them more services and then to encourage them to produce or complete more peer activities. Yeah, and, and what I like about this is, you know, although we use different systems, it's really about getting the right information for your staff. And so I can see, you know, by advocate, I could have three advocates that are working with 20 families and two of those advocates may have 19 of 20 families engaged while one, the third advocate may only have 10 of 20 families engaged. And so it shows a coachable moment with that third advocate to say, how do we encourage these things? Um, I can click on this and see the families who are engaged in at-home reading and those that aren't. And so if those that aren't, it might be a good opportunity to give them a tour of our lending library and, and make sure that they have access to, to reading materials. Um, and, and so that's just another way to really easily give feedback and have quick touch points with, with families without having to really fish through a lot of data. And I also want to add, similar to what Michael was talking about earlier, it's transparency in the data. So not only is this information used by managers, but the staff levels get this information every week so that they too know where they stand with their caseload and everybody is on the same page within the center and then with their own supervisors and managers. And, and one of the questions we got, which is you know, a very good question, is that some data systems um, might not allow you the flexibility in, in pulling reports. Um, you know, before we were on Shine Insight and we used different systems, um, we had Amber run different reports for us for that like data that we needed. I, obviously at that time, it's gonna be a little bit of, of a cumbersome process because we're requiring at that point, Amber to go through kind of um, room by room to pull that information but what's critical is that you have that information at your fingertips that you can quickly react to and respond to. Um, and that means you can get to a place of impact with a short turnaround. This is an example. These are examples of information and data that we look at monthly. 
Um, we're going to share some screenshots of what our MBE report looks like, and MBE standing for Management by Execution of our program approach. So not only is it important to look at data, like we did in the last few reports, of just hard number data, but we also measure our processes and our execution of processes. So what we mean by that are looking at our coaching numbers, our goal progress with families. So if producing those weekly reports and the daily reports drive staff work, then hopefully we see that gain in goal progress with families. Also similar with family engagement, reviewing that information on a weekly, daily basis and allowing them to target the families in need. We hope to see higher levels of family engagement, whether that be home or center level activities. And again, we take it a step further by even looking at HR metrics. I'm um, taking into consideration how data may look when you have new hires or where, when you're in the process of onboarding new staff. What does it look like at certain centers with staff retention and even staff attendance? And where that's so critical is, I'm sure like your programs, you know, we have a lot of robust systems and protocols in play to allow us to have the highest amount of impact. But it's also important to take a realistic approach with our staff from an HR perspective so that we know that when someone's in the onboarding process, we might have to make it an adaptation to our typical protocols. For example, coaching will look a lot different for someone who's in their first three months of, of working with us as opposed to someone who's been in here for, for three years. But having all of those data points really makes us, allows us to make those decisions without losing um, efficiency, without losing quality as we make those adaptations. These are a couple of examples of what our MBE report looks like and again is produced and sent to all staff levels to reflect on at a monthly basis. Um, so the first is the education as we talked about looking at coachings per center and the second one on here is um, just an example of dental concerns and how we may track children needing dental concerns and their treatment throughout the period of the month. So again, just taking a moment for you to review this data and call out any information or any number that may stand out to you, whether it be a reason of concern or maybe even something to celebrate. And when you see something that stands out, feel free to send it in via chat and, and we'll talk about it. For me, as a, a former director of education, one of the things that, you know, really stands out on the education side is the coaching number. So if you look at our center 10, you know, well below our, our target coaching with only 21% of teachers coach versus 14% of assistant teachers coach. And this is where I pull back the layers, you know. Um, for example, it may be the case that we have one of our early learning inclusion specialists out on leave. So that high performing center director has stepped into the role and, and taken on additional responsibility. So the adaptation for that month is rather than coach every one of our teachers, we only coach teachers who are in their first year of, of tenure with our organization. On the other hand, I may find that that center director has difficulty with time management. And so it's a great opportunity to, to have a teachable moment, to look at the calendar together and make sure that our staff are getting the, the coaching and professional development that, that they deserve. But the one thing we don't wanna do is just jump to the conclusion. We really wanna sift through that and, and see what's happening. Here's another set of examples of what we produce for what we consider our MBE reports. Um, the first graph is a breakdown of, again, a roll up, I should say, of our family engagement numbers. So this particular pie chart represents the amount of families we have in the program that we consider to be either minimally engaged, fully engaged, or not engaged. And of that breakdown is even further of a breakdown to see how far along we are in reaching fully engaged for our families. 
Um, and then again, an example, as I spoke to, we look at HR data to be able to review what teacher attendance and assistant teacher attendance looks like over a period of, you know, the first six months of our program year and be able to, again, target and help support staff along the way. And this will help us get, gain a lot of information because we may find that there's a trend whereby um, the higher the attendance, the higher the retention. We may find a trend that the lower the teacher and assistant attendance, um, the lower the student attendance. We will see things like in December where we have um, lower rates of attendance and increased focus on curriculum fidelity and really supporting our substitutes to be able to implement our curriculums at a high level so that there's no drop off for students. Um, and so there's really you know, no limit to the kind of data that you can gather, but it's a matter of how do you wanna connect it to your practices to make sure you're having the greatest impact. So here's an example of a report, which we call our executive MBI, MBI Management by Information, that we actually share with our board and policy committee members on a monthly basis. We decided as a program that these were the top metrics that we wanted to continuously talk about with this group of people to be able to ask, you know, for additional input and questions. And again, this is similar to our other reports, um, and it's reviewed with them monthly. And what's great about this is you, you train your board and PC to read this data the same way that we do our staff, but it's easy to have conversations as well as we can send this to them before meetings so they come prepared to really discuss um, strengths and discuss concerns as well as to gain in buy-in of support. And so we may say at center one, we're under enrolled and we don't have a wait list. So we really need to increase um, enrollment in that area. But actually, our board chair also volunteers at the community center that's across the street from that center. So it's a great opportunity for that board member to um, bring, our, bring our flyers and pamphlets to the community center, um, share that resource with staff at the community center so that it can improve our recruiting process. So it's always getting those hands in there and, and having the dialogue. Um, and sometimes the board and PC will give us really great strategies that we haven't thought about that really allow us to improve in, in these areas. It's also a great chance for them to celebrate our staff because they'll see high performance at various centers and be able to go back to that center director, to that family advocate, to that teacher, to really congratulate them on the great work they're doing. But our born PC is always gonna feel well informed about the work that we're doing as well as have the opportunity for meaningful input and impact. So as I spoke of earlier, this is an example of a family engagement report card that we produce quarterly. So as Michael said earlier, we believe in the consistent, reliable, and transparent review of data. And we also encourage that of our parents. So we produce the report card and give it to them on a quarterly basis. This is an example of the child or family engagement card. We want you to just look through it and, and give us some feedback or um, anything that you recognize with this particular report card. So to us, what stands out with this particular family is that they are hitting or exceeding all of the benchmarks that targets that we ask of them. So again, for example, um, our peer activity cards, which are home learning activities, we aim for a target of five hours per month. And as you can see for March, April, and May, they have well exceeded those targets that we ask of families. Um, and same really with every level of engagement within the center. It also has a breakdown of the child's attendance. So to see if there's any correlation, again, with the child coming to school and the engagement of the families within the center. When I think about family engagement, it's often other families that can encourage their peers to come join some of these meetings and join these activities. And so when we see uh, a highly engaged parent, it's easy to identify and, and really allow them to become our family ambassadors whereby that can be the parent to 
invite a parent who maybe hasn't been to an activity that year to come along with them to a family learning party to really get the, the benefit. And that starts to mobilize that parent as a, as a very strong advocate for your center. So while we're kind of decreasing some of the load from our family advocates or our teaching staff, we're increasing that parent's ability as a, as a school leader and as a family and as an advocate for other families. The next couple of reports are also something we produce quarterly. Um, this is what we consider our MBO report, which is management by outcomes. So it is a quarterly reflection of the outcomes of our children and the mastery as it pertains to social emotional language literacy and math and science. Um, so the first graph shows, again, example data of what it may look like at a breakdown of the center of how many four-year-olds who received mastery scores for the current quarter. And then under the second graph is how we take it a step further and look at like a subgroup analysis of that same information. So again, it's breaking down the outcomes even further into looking at children who achieve mastery based on attendance levels, um, special edu education services they're receiving within our program, looking at children's outcomes in their first year of Head Start versus their third year of Head Start, looking at children who are dual language learners and their outcomes and then even program options. And then lastly, we produce something called Ocelero Stat, which is reviewed among all leadership on a biannual basis. So we actually will then take time to reflect every six months on our overall program goals. So an example goal that we had as a program was to increase families engagement levels by 10 percentage points at the center level versus our previous targets. So now again, we take those roll up of daily, weekly, monthly reports, whether it based on numbers or execution and see, okay, as a program, how did we do for the first six months of our program year? And this is an example where we look at centers from last year to this year to see if we hit our goal of the 10% increase. So obviously we went through a lot of different examples of data sets. Um, is there any questions before we move ahead? All right, so this, this last thing that we want to talk about is really just understanding data that we have utilized to drive program improvements and identify ways and types of data that can be utilized so first, we talked a, a, about this, but really our sharing of data is to ensure data is shared across multiple touch points. There's data sets that we'll get daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannually, annually, but they're always part of ongoing discussions. So an example, if you take a, you know, an average month, that first week of that month, our core leadership team, meaning our directors of service areas, will meet together. We're looking at this data, discussing um, trends, discussing areas where we might um, need proactive next steps. That second week, data is being shared with PC and board, continuing that conversation from the first week of the month. In the third week, service areas, teams are meeting together. So it might be a center director meeting, it might be a family service meeting with our director of family services and, and our family service coordinators. That again, continues these conversations. So if we agreed on some next steps in week one, by week three, they're talking about how did implement, implementation look over those last two weeks? Um, where are we having some positive course correction? Where are we having input? In week four, our cross-functional team meets. So this is a meeting that actually Amber facilitates where she meets with just directors of fam with, um, service areas to really focus on two or three key priorities for the next month and ensure that all hands are deck, all hands on deck in meeting that. And then, as we said before, different data sets are in the hands of, of all staff. And so whether you're the director, whether you're the assistant teacher, whether you're um, a, a family advocate, you have that ability to see your data, know what's happening and know how to, how to intervene as necessary. And so in that way, we're always assessing, we, we ha always have opportunities to, to grow. Um, some other examples are our SASE, which is our self-assessment system for continuous improvement and evaluation, which is a way to always have ongoing assessments, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, 
Data sets can include employee opinion surveys, focus groups, exit interviews. Obviously, for education, you're going to look at student assessment and student screeners. For family services, you're going to look at home visits, parent-teacher conference, monthly check-ins. And you can also use data from professional development, such as partnership agreements, coaching cycles, um, professional learning communities, one-on-ones um, -on to really ensure that those things in play, those next steps um, are moving forward. And so by doing that, you, you have a roadmap that defines your program's development way because you're always assessing program. I think about our SASE, which incorporates both compliance and execution practices and gives us an opportunity to highlight success as one way that we look at data in an ongoing basis. So one thing I do with my team is we have quarterly check-ins and at these check-ins, we make team commitments. So the check-ins, um, they include our service area directors and our board chair. We start with the leadership learning opportunity. You know, we may talk about, um, you know, uh, an article, a recent journal article or a book that we've read to really promote our, ourselves as leaders and invest in ourselves as leaders. And we follow that with updates from each service area. And I'll talk about what those updates look like. And then we end the day with a team builder. And the reason I like to end with a team builder is I know that sometimes for some of our staff, when we're being really transparent about our data, um, it can be, you know, it can cause some anxiety. Sometimes it can be nervous. And I want to end with a fun team builder to show that like what we're doing here isn't creating nerves. It isn't creating anxiety. We're really taking advantage of each other's strengths, um, knowledge, skill sets to move forward. And so that, so that team builder helps us wrap us in that this is just a fun, productive day to really move things forward. So in that check-in, the key components they share, their successes and accomplishments over the last quarter, their challenges and vulnerabilities over that same time period, as well as commitments for the next quarter. And then they update partnership agreement goals, and if applicable, um, updates for corrective action. So again, all of this is shared with all the directors across all service areas. So we all know what each other are do, are, is doing, what our next priorities are, and it has the chance for that great synergy because if my family service director says, you know, at, at center four, we're under enrolled, so we're really gonna push recruitment hard over the next month, our director of education may say, you know, we actually have a teacher work day next Friday, and we can carve two hours out to assign teachers to go to um, different community spaces or to knock on doors to really help with that recruitment. And so we're always leading towards next steps um, and really asking ourselves these questions of, you know, is, is are the things we're doing going to help us achieve better outcomes? Are we strengthening and addressing form performance errors positively? Um, what, what resources do we need to commit to make sure Another thing we look at is employee opinion surveys. And so I'm sure some of you use employee surveys now and some of you may not. Um, but I, I would highly encourage it. And the reason we use it is because it gives us a touch point every year to understand employee engagement and satisfaction and to analyze the, just where we're at as an organization and at centers. So we'll ask questions like, does your manager foster positive relationships? Are you paid fairly for the work you do? Um, does our organization effectively manage change? And we've learned a lot from it. Like, for example, we consider ourselves a very innovative program, and we found that we need to have a very intentional focus on change management, a shared language around change management. And so we've really refined our processes for rolling out innovations in a way that allows for maximum buy-in as well as allows for staff to really feel um, part of that change and, and ready for changes that may occur. Um, something else we learned about were um, the, the need for increased professional development for our leaders, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the reason this was so important to us is because we were worried about our retention. And so when we look at the data, we found that some measures of workplace satisfaction include do I have too much stress at work? Am I happy working at the Head Start program I'm at? Um, do I feel like I'm making a positive impact on children in my class or, or families in my center? 
Um, is my work environment a pleasant atmosphere that makes me want to do outstanding work? And do I have a strong relationship with my senator? So we knew that if we wanted to retain staff, we had to hit these workplace satisfaction measures. But all the data we collected, or, or the primary source of data, was from our employee opinion surveys. And so some things we did to, to respond to that um, were leadership listening tours. So myself, with my director of human resources, um, visit all of our centers multiple times a year. When we visit the centers, we have an open agenda but it's pretty consistent across all centers in that we allow the staff there um, without any leader, other leadership present to just have an open conversation with them. That can include um, sharing great strategies that are, that are working there that they want us to know about or perhaps bring to other centers. It could be simple celebrations of peers or, or supervisors that they're working with or stories of success with their, with their families and students. It can also be an opportunity for them to ask questions and address concerns, which could be anything from our own protocols to questions about state licensing or Head Start performance standards. But all of this open flow of information builds a lot of trust and it improves our work environment because I can then quickly act on the feedback I receive. Something else we heard is that our leaders need more, more skill building and chances for development. And so I'm sure many of your programs have been in a similar situation, but what we found is, you know, many of our center directors were very high performing teachers that got promoted. Many, many of our high performing family advocates got promoted into a family service. But when we did these staff surveys, what we found is sometimes there was a disconnect in the conversations that were happening or staff didn't feel they had the whole story. And so we were comfortable with that reflection. It, didn't, it wasn't what we wanted to hear, but we didn't point the finger at our management. We thought, okay, what do we need to do differently in order to, to really change these things that we don't feel comfortable with? Um, so we've, we've instituted five one and two day workshops for all of our managers, our center directors and coordinators, which are designed around our values and leverages the best practices for, for HR but applied to our early childhood space. And it's skill building for managers that help them become better coaches, better leaders, um, and tied to the data that we collected. So it's sending that message to employees that what they share with us, we're gonna value and respond to. And so just last week, we had one of these workshop series. It was on open communication. So we discussed things such as difficult conversations and how to prepare for difficult conversations, um, how to be an effective listener, um, and, and, you know, things like how to, how to avoid or counteract implicit bias. And so by doing that, we're using the data to see where we could do better and trying to respond as quickly as possible in a way that will, will help the, the greatest number of our staff. And what we've seen is um, compared to this, this point in time last year, our retention is up um, 9% which for us equates to about 30 staff members. And as we all know, the more we're able to retain staff, um, the, the greater quality and the more likelihood we have of, of really hitting our outcomes. And so we see a couple of questions here. So we wanna take the time to, to answer questions. So if anyone else has questions, um, feel free to send it through. Um, so one of the questions is, do we have one staff person in charge of pulling data reports? All staff and leaders have the ability to pull reports, but the examples that we showed are pulled by me on a weekly, monthly um, basis. So a little bit of both. So the ones that we produce to the masses is always pulled by me, the data person. And then for um, any staff, again, just looking to work on a day-to-day -day basis off the reports, they have the ability to pull their own. Yep. And, you know, based on where you're at and where, like what your site is or who's in your classroom, we set the, our data system up so that they just have access to that information. So it's not cumbersome. They're not seeing, um, you know, other confidential information. They're really just seeing the information relevant to the families on their caseload. Um, so another question we have is about our process for data entry and how it's kept up on a daily basis. Um, you know, how much time does it take and, and who is entering? So a lot of our data is actually entered in by, by our staff members on site. 
So for example, every time a family advocate will meet with parents, they'll update those notes. Um, anytime a teacher is completing a screening, she'll up, up, he or she will upload the completed screening into our data system with the, with the results of the screening. Um, same for, for our help team and so forth. And so it makes it a lot easier because we have 300 staff who are inputting information. But obviously at that point, your directors and your, your managers your coordinators are checking in, um, doing weekly audits on, on a small sample to make sure that data is in and updated. Um, but as we said before, you know, by having these data systems, it can lend to your coaching, to your one-on-ones, to your check-ins. And so if I saw, you know, my education team wasn't putting in action plans for children um, with challenging behaviors, I could easily have that audit and share it with my director of education. We can come up with that action plan to make sure the information is going in. In other cases, um, Amber may enter that data. We also hire three clerks who assist with that. And I think with the daily director report that we send out, it's just a snapshot to see that those numbers are moving. And if they're not, it's to peel away at the layers by the, the managers to be able to see why not. Yep. And, and you know, because we're happy with our system, a lot of these things are, are automated reports. And so once you set it up, it's as simple as clicking a button to be able to get the, the report for, um, you know, the subsequent days or weeks, which you're looking at data. Um, and then someone asked the name of the data system we utilize, and that's Shine Insight. So if anyone else has questions, feel free to send them in and, and we'll continue to answer. Um, but we certainly want to thank you for your, for your participation. Um, we have both mine and Amber's email on here. So if you have any question or feedback for us, um, any comments, feel free to, to contact us. Um, and you know, we'll be happy to touch base or, or brainstorm as the case may be. But thank you for taking the time out of your day and we hope you found some usefulness from, from today's webinar. Michael and Amber, there is a question sitting in the Q&A. Um, they're asking if, would you send us examples of your team building activities at the end? Yeah, for sure. And um, I mean, I can, I can share some now. So, um, you know, one thing we're looking at is just like inclusiveness of, of our environments. And so for the last um, one of our last meetings, we invited people to bring in um, games from their, you know, from their family, their childhood, their culture. And so I actually held that particular um, quarterly retreat at my house. The morning we did the leadership activity, they did the report outs, um, and then we played a series of games. So that included like cornhole, that included um, loteria. And I think it's great because you know, I'm, I'm newly married. Sometimes my, my wife will come home and tell me great things that happen in the day. Sometimes she'll tell me like frustrating things that happen. But, you know, no one ever comes home from work and say like, oh, I played cornhole with my peers. And it, it was awful. Like it, it sets that stage for like a good, friendly, positive environment. Um, you know, another time we did actually our office Olympics. And so, you know, we had like, four square, we did a rock, paper, scissor tournament. Um, again, like really simple things that allow us to, to laugh together, enjoy, you know, enjoy our time together. And it really takes off the, the edge of, of anxiousness. Um, and, and we've seen that it, like as leaders, as we model that, it happens at the center. So we've seen like um, Friendsgiving at centers and, and things of that nature, which, you know, makes me really proud because I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir when I say like, in ECE, we should really care about play. Um, but I'm also a believer that like, if we don't model some amount of play with each other, um, we're, not, we're not doing a good job of modeling it with, for our kids. So um, those, those are just some of the general activities. Any other questions before we close out for the day? All right, well, we appreciate your time and I'll give it to you, Fernanda, to, to close us out.
Thank you, Michael. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending this month's Innovations webinar, Pushing Data. Uh, I want to primarily thank our presenters today, Michael Mitchell and Amber Early, for their time and knowledge. Um, I would like to also remind you once more that this session will be recorded and will be made available on demand um, for you later today um, up on our website at, at www.region9hsa.org. Um, and also, like Michael mentioned, uh, their email information is going to be on your screen right now. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to them. If not, uh, you can also contact us here at the Region 9 Association, and um, we're happy to direct your questions accordingly. Um, thanks again, Michael and Amber, and thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.